Uh, Yuma, good evening everybody. Uh, welcome to the National Library of Australia and to this uh, very special conversation between Julianne Schultz, author of The Idea of Australia, A Search for the Soul of the Nation, and Dr Chris Wallace, Associate Pro Professor at the University of Canberra. Uh, my name is Luke Hickey. Uh, I'm the Assistant Director General of the Engagement Branch here at the National Library and in month three of a new role for me. Uh, which is very exciting, um, particularly to get to introduce events such as these. Uh, as we begin, I'd like to acknowledge uh, Australia's First Nations peoples, the first Australians, as the traditional owners and custodians of this land and give my respects to elders, past and present. Um, through them, to all Australian and Aboriginal uh, Torres Strait Islanders uh, that are with us, uh, either here today in the theatre, and it's wonderful to see faces back in the building, uh, or for those who are joining us on the live stream on Facebook as well. Uh, welcome to you from Ngunnawal and Ngambri country. Emeritus Professor Julianne Schultz is the chair of the conversation. Uh, she was the publisher and founding editor of the Griffith Review and is Professor Emeritus of Media and Culture at Griffith Centre for Social and Cultural Research. Uh, she's an acclaimed author uh, of Reviving the Fourth Estate and Steel City Blues and librettos to the award-winning operas Black River and Going Into the Shadows. Julianne became a member of the Order of Australia for Services to Journalism and the Community and an honorary fel fellow of the Australian Academy of Humanities the following year. She has served on the board of directors of the ABC, Grattan Institute and Copyright Agency and chaired the Australian Film, TV and Radio School Queensland Design Council and National Cultural Policy Reference Group. I'm not sure what you do in your spare time, Julianne. In the idea of Australia, a search for the soul of the nation, uh, she challenges our notions of what it means to be Australian and asks timely and urgent questions about our national identity. Here at the National Library of Australia, our vision is to connect all Australians with national collections with the aim of enriching our understanding about who we are and our place in the world. What a perfect venue to host this conversation tonight. So please join me in welcoming Julianne Schultz to present The Idea of Australia, A Search for the Soul of the Nation. Julianne. Thank you very much. It's lovely to be back here um, after such a long, a long absence. We've done obviously lots of Griffith Review events here over the years and um, I was very pleased when, when the library said that they were just on the cusp of being able to start doing live events again and were offered to host, host this discussion this evening. Um, the format is going to be slightly different than, than a Q&A because I thought it might be useful to just sketch out some of the ideas that are in the book that relates specifically to this part of Canberra. And excuse me, my throat is a bit strange. Um, so I'm going to talk for about 25 minutes or so, which sort of draws from one of the, <coughs> one of the chapters in the books, and then Chris and I will have a conversation um, and take it from there. So the chapter that I'm sort of talking to tonight is one called The Architecture of Silence. The year an overwhelming majority of Australians voted effectively to recognise First Nations people was the, was the year before I started high school. Um, and and this, that year, WEH Stanner presented the ABC Boyer Lectures. <clears throat> In them, he coined a phrase which has had a life of its own ever since, the Great Australian Silence. It was in many ways a phrase that provided the previously unmentioned scaf scaffolding for the other famous 1960s phrase, the lucky country. We know Donald Horne meant that term ironically, but his book does not fully address this silence and its role in creating um, the luck that he described. His phrase became a slogan, and in the land of silence, forgetting and denial, the foundation of its good fortune was obscured. Stanner was talking about the original sin of the Australian settlement, the willful decision at the time of Federation to believe that the First Nations people were a dying race who could be dismissed and made invisible and denied the right to vote or fully participate in the life of the new nation. The legislation that enforced this decision came nearly 100 years after British officials failed to heed the advice of Jeremy Bentham, whose designs for penal, the penal colony prisons they were quite happy to adopt, that the failure to reach a new settlement and treaty threatened to be an incurable flaw. 
over the intervening century, various iterations of ignoring, silencing, forgetting prevailed to make this flaw seem to be truly incurable, as the even as the colonies gained some independence. As Stanner said in 1968, what may well have begun as a simple forgetting turned into habit and over time into something like a cult of forgetfulness practised on a national scale. We've been able to, for so long to disremember the Aborigines that we now hard put to keep them in mind even when we most want to do so. This was in 1968, which is a year after the referendum, which meant that, for, that the federal government had responsibility for, the first, for First Nations peoples. They could be counted in the census, and it was more than a decade before they were, but yet it was more than a decade before they, like all other Australians, were required to vote. At the time, Stanner thought the tide might be turning, but worried that it might be just another year in the old plateau of complacency. There was some movement, the tent embassy was established, some land rights became real, the news media started to report seriously the Aboriginal issues, but children were still being taken and, lots, and, and the lot of most First Nations people was deplorable. Stanner was right to be cautious. The complacency and silence, trauma and shame remained and got worse. Twelve years later, another Boyer lecturer, the great art historian Bernard Smith, revisited similar territory. His lectures were called The Spectre of Truganini. They're arguably the most politically and morally challenging series, of, uh, series that the national broadcaster has ever transmitted. And they're informed by Bernard Smith's deep knowledge of the nation's cultural history. He declared that a culture's vitality and capacity for survival would depend largely on the quality of the moral values it brings to the solution of human problems. Values born of its own historical experience, values which are and which are and necessarily continuously tested. Over five weeks in his lectures, he described the way the white blanket of forgetfulness had been repeatedly thrown over the carcass of genocide that haunted the nation and wondered whether the deep fear of change would render the country unviable in the next century. Yet he dreamed that a Makarata, a treaty coming together after struggle, would be in place before the bicentenary, which was then eight years hence. 37 years later, the plea for a Makarata formed the centrepiece of the Uluru Statement from the Heart, a plea that at the time was rejected rather than just ignored. A decade after his death, one can only imagine the despair Bernard Smith, like the other great scholars, advocates, politicians and public servants of his generation, would feel about this approach. The gap between the culturally informed and concerned conscience that, that he advocated and a brutal nitpicking politics, intolerant of dissent, has grown to become a chasm. It's taking much longer than Bernard Smith had optimistically predicted for the truths that were swept out the door to blow, black, to blow back through an open window. Silence is not just an absence. Sophisticated scaffolding is needed to keep the black hole open and empty. It takes determination for a nation created out of rec reports and official inquiries to hide. Bureaucracies thrive on records and the early administrators uh, sent to establish an open air penal settlement, documented everything in fine copper plate. Reports, documents and accounts were written on parchment, tied in blue ribbon and sent back to Whitehall. There they were considered, reviewed, filed and tucked away in archives. Later records from the colonies and states were typed in triplicate and also sorted and filed. But many decisions and documents tr crumbled like the paper on which they were written. Institutions sometimes prefer to hide their secrets in plain sight. Nations with shameful stories, like families, develop a habit of secrecy and will go to extraordinary lengths to maintain the silence. This is not confined to the distant past. Those in power and with something to hide and a flexible attachment to the liberal conventions will stretch the tools at their disposal to protect themselves, closing courts, redacting documents, pillaring individuals, bringing politically inflected charges and destroying lives in the process. For a nation with a bureaucratic creation story, its record keeping has left a lot to be desired. There are stories, there are stories um, of lost and inadequate records in every state and territory. Queensland is home to several of the most instruct instructive, which I describe in the, in the idea of Australia. But this did not mean that people who were paying attention were ignorant. Carl Feilberg, who was inducted into the Australian Media of Hall of Fame in 2018, 130 years after his death, paid a high price for his campaign against the brutality of the all-disciplined uh, Queensland Native Police. 
He lost his job as the editor of the Queenslander after documenting what he's described as the promiscuous massacres. Every resident of, Queens, of Brisbane, he wrote in 1880, who becoming aware of what is going on, neglects to do Ne neglects to do what he can in his capacity as a citizen and a voter to wipe out the stain which rests on the whole colony, shares in the disgrace of it. We know now that the extent of the violent attacks, reprisals and massacres was vast and undeniable. Further research and increasingly sophisticated analysis suggests that the Queensland Native Police Force was responsible for 66,680 killings and probably more, resulting in many tens of thousands of deaths that were described by Feilberg at the time as profligate, furtive and unprosecuted. When Paul Hasluck travelled east from Perth in 1941 to take up a position in the Federal Department of External Affairs, the journalist and academic who later became a Liberal government minister and governor general was astonished to discover the inadequacy of the record keeping. Hasluck was one of a new breed of public servants drawn to Canberra by the existential t threat of war, even before Darwin was bombed and the Japanese subs entered Sydney Harbour. His skills as a researcher and oral, oral historian and journalist were invaluable in the reconstruction effort that began even before the war was over. Shortly after he arrived in the department, he asked for highly confidential cables on Syria to help prepare a brief on a possible Allied intervention. He was instead brought a file on Tasmania, the clerk who brought it to him, he later recounted, said she could not find Syria in the index files, but one of the boys told her it was in a town in Tasmania, so she hoped that that would do. <laughs> uh, the department files were a mess. Record keeping was chaotic. Access to information and past decisions depended on memory and networks. Hasluck was appalled, but it took another 20 years before the archives were given some autonomy, although they were still in the Prime Minister's department and 1983 before legislation was passed for it to become an independent authority. Four score years and two since the nation itself had come into being, were its records then to be captured. The greatest secrecy always attached this to records that threatened to reveal what was known about politically inspired or sanctioned abuses of power. But that's not what I want to talk about tonight. What I want to talk about is this part of Canberra, um, because I think it really tells a big story. Buildings often reveal priorities more, often, more robustly than words. As I was writing the book, I came to wonder what some future archaeologist uncovering the remnants of the Commonwealth of Australia would make of this precinct. Because in my search for the soul of the nation, this area, because if, if my search was for the soul of the nation, this area is surely its heart. Certainly there are grand and natural wonders which we've appropriated into the national psyche. The rock monolith at the centre of the nation, the extraordinary corals of the barrier reef, the remarkable coastline, the vast interior, and the built environment that's been created by people seeking to create monuments of note. Most particularly, obviously, the extraordinary opera house, which has its own international stature. But in any nation, the buildings in the national capital really provide the best clues to what is valued, what is important, what is the ethos of the place and its people. This is particularly so in capitals that have been created rather than those that have evolved over centuries. You see it in the grand buildings in Washington, where the axis of power is clear to see. You, you see it in contemporary Berlin, where the preferred building material for the many new government buildings is glass a physical manifestation of the new value placed on transparency and openness. As many of you know so well, this has long been a, matter of, been a matter of long standing discussion and dispute in this city. My purpose is not to say what could or should have been done, but to reflect on what is here and what it says about the nation now. Whereas the other Australian capital cities can trace their origins to colonial days, Canberra is very much a product of our Australian creation, for good or ill. As Billy Hughes said at the inauguration ceremony in 1913, before he became Prime Minister, the nation is unfolding without the slightest trace of that race we have banished from the face of the earth. We must not be too proud, lest we should too in time disappear. We must take steps to safeguard the foothold we now have. Walter Burley Griffin and Marion Marnie's design for Canberra included a national archive in the parliamentary triangle of the national capital. The American designers drew on the institutions of their own capital, where a grand neoclassical archive takes pride of place between Congress and the White House. And people queue for hours to see the founding documents and to search for their own records. 
But as other cultural institutions grew on the banks of the lake, named for Walter Burley Griffin, plans for the archives literally fell off the drawing board. First, it was to be a wing of this library. Then on a site overlooking the precinct that's since become the ASIO headquarters. Then again, a separate building near the library. Two competitions were held to find the best design. Two winners were selected, but none were built. Today, the National Archives leases one of the modest Art Deco buildings on the outer edge of the precinct, its records stored off-site in a stylish building in an industrial estate on the outskirts of town. Its place in the hierarchy, if we take buildings as a, as a metaphor, is plain to see. This construct, the construction of this library, just a little over 50 years ago, was also an example of an approach that put a negative dollar value on symbolic resonance and design integrity. As the, the library's website notes, the style of the building is called contemporary classical. And it was influenced by the work of the American ar architect Edward Stone, and more importantly, by the Parthenon in Greece. The building was planned to have 17 columns on one axis and eight on the other, like the Parthenon. <clears throat> Instead, at the insistence of the penny pinchers at the National Capital Authority, and one man in particular, one row of columns was cut to save a mere $250,000 which unbalanced the design and stands as a testament to both a lack of imagination and more. Um, it's, you know, it's sort of a bureaucratic, silly decision, but it sort of says an enormous amount. Instead of being the home of the National Archives, um, the important chunk of lakeside land was used to build Questacon, a science museum. It's a much loved destination and a great place to take small children. But it's an unlikely building to have pride of place on the core axis of the precinct. Again, to follow the money is revealing. Quest of Con was funded in large measure by a bicentennial gift from the Japanese government. At the time, Japan was Australia's most important trading partner. It was only 40 years after the Second World War when the fear of a Japanese invasion had galvanised the nation. As we continue the journey along the lake, to, there is now, of course, the National Portrait Gallery, which Tom Roberts, the artist, had argued in the early days of Federation should have been built then. It took nearly five score years before it finally opened its, door, its doors. Even this tardy begin, beginning would not have been possible without the determined advocacy and support of Gordon and Mary, Marilyn Darling, who personally encouraged Prime Minister Howard to visit the Comparable Museum in Washington, which tipped the scales. Moving along the lakefront, there's the High Court, which it's worth remembering has only been the final Court of Appeal for the nation since 1988, and the National Gallery, which has been made and remade several times in its relatively short life. <clears throat> of course, my future archaeologists would pay due attention to the old Parliament House up the, and the new building partly submerged in the hill further up. Much has been said about them, and I won't add to that discussion tonight. But I wonder what she would make of the Magna Carta place, tucked into an otherwise desolate corner near the Rose Gardens, just to the side of the old Parliament House. The recent rise of the Magna Carta in the founding mythology of this country is intriguing. It's one of those causes, causes that's been carefully nurtured despite the demonstrable ab absence of any particular re relevance um, to the founding of the penal colony, and it's rather arbitrary forms of justice, or even to the creation of federation. But ever since Sir Robert Menzies outbid the British Museum and found the money to acquire one of the last copies of the document, it has had a growing place in the hearts of many of our cons more conservative politicians. Just as the go Japanese government donated the money to build Questacon, the British donated the money to build Magna Carta Place with its buried time capsule, um, uh, which is due to be opened maybe my, by my somewhat mystified archeologist in 2101 suggesting that our sacred sites may be available. This combination suggests that our sacred sites may be available to the highest bidder. It's also less likely that you'd find much evidence of the Aboriginal tent embassy, which, would have, which has occupied the plot outside the old parliament since 1972. Who knows, by then, there might be the remnants of an Aboriginal resting place in the precinct. The construction of a museum for Aboriginal Australia was first seriously proposed in an, an official report by John Mulvaney in 1974. It was endorsed the following year, but in the intervening half century, in the intervening half century, there have been another 14 reports recommending this in one form or another, but still nothing has materialised. A few months ago, the current Prime Minister put on his best Dreamtime tie and promised, the, <laughs> promised that the first steps towards the creation of an official resting place would be made after the election. I hope it's right, but we will see. 
Absences speak volumes. There's still plenty of space, of course, along this area. So what is missing from this precinct is also important, part of the architecture of silence. There's no immigration museum, despite this being a country built on immigration, although that's part, obviously part of the remit of the National Museum. The Film and Sound Archive, with its extraordinary records, is not here and available, immediately accessible. There's no landscape or photographic museum. There's no formal museum of federation. I know many of these areas are covered elsewhere, but they're part of the cultural, and, uh, but they are really important parts of the cultural and political riches that define their nation, that define the nation. And so their absence is itself noteworthy. As you all know, the cultural institutions have been struggling for years, weakened by a lack of respect, recognition and resources. The waiting time for the archives for requests had grown so embarrassingly long that the clearance rate has been dropped from its annual report. <coughs> and despite the legislative requirement of a maximum 90-day wait. This is often honoured in the breach. 10,000 requests have been left unanswered for a year, another 10,000 for five to 10 years, and 2,566 have been waiting for a release for more than 10 years. Allocating scarce pud, cup, pub, blah, 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 have a glass of water. Allocating scarce public funding requires judgments about priorities. Some of those involved in the campaign to get resources for the archives wondered, <coughs> wondered whether a cash-strapped, avowedly pro-disclosure disclosure, organisation should have spent millions of dollars and the time of its most senior officials for almost a decade trying to prevent access to its documents. As authoritarians everywhere know, and I'm not suggesting that they are, but, but that it's worth drawing the connection. Even old, offic old official records are not neutral artefacts. In 2011, when Jenny Hocking began her Kafkaesque battle for access to the correspondence between the Governor General and Buckingham Palace, this was a battle that went on to cost the archives probably about $2 million until the High Court required that the documents be released. Not long after her request, her quest to open and read the 1,200 pages of correspondence had begun, the archives was reclassified as an, a national, an agency of national security rather than in the cultural organisation's um, machinery of government. This reflects the way national security was displacing economics as the dominant lingua franca of policy here. And national security necessarily requires secrecy. Again, buildings spoke volumes. The new headquarters for the spy agencies were built in a prime position overlooking the lake that had once been earmarked for the archives. Half a billion dollars was recently allocated to expand the Australian War Memorial Complex and turn its memorial into a, what many have described as a war museum. The Griffins had imagined its elevated site on the, on the Parliament House axis as the place for a pleasure palace, a casino in the parlance of the day. The de devastation of the First World War, where the live or die game of two up had distracted men facing death, shifted priorities back here. Pleasure palaces slipped off the agenda, and instead the site came to house a memorial, which was built and opened as another, as another war took its toll in lives. The sweeping views from the eternal flame over the pool of reflection and across the lake to Parliament put the human cost of war at the sober heart of national life. As you know, there are howls of opposition to the plans to undermine the ethos embedded in the memorial that many felt was implicit in the new designs. The allocation of so much money to what had become the top tourist attraction in Canberra, while the other cultural institutions resorted to crowdfunding, also was a very telling moment. The idea of Australia, like the idea of a life, is as much shaped by the silence as the stories we tell ourselves and, and as the institutions we've created. Secrets need to be heard with compassion and without judgment, not to re-traumatise but to release, and so that reparations can be made, the old power structures modified. There are lessons in how this might be done from home and abroad. In 1985, Richard Weizsäcker, the German president at the time, gave a speech that set the framework for modern Germany. It was described by the Israeli embassy ambassador as a moment of glory. The horrors of genocidal war still hung very heavily in Germany, but he said, he being Weissacker said, it was not a matter of coming to terms with a past that could not, could not be made undone. However, anyone who closes his eyes to the past is blind to the present. Whoever refuses to remember the, in, the inhumanity is prone to new risks of infection. 
In the book, I explore some of the other ways in which the architecture of silence has produced a society where the attachment to official secrecy has deep roots and impinges, I think, on, this, on the soul of the nation. Culture, censorship, draconian legislation, closed courts and more. But those of you who live here, who know and love this precinct, have a special responsibility. One of the arguments I make in the book is that a lot of the responsibility comes back to the local. And in Canberra, this is the core of the local. I would hope that in the coming decades, it becomes, this precinct especially, becomes a better representation of an open, inquiring society. One that's not ashamed of the past, but willing to face it openly and honestly. And that that's reflected in the built environment which provides a new architecture. Thank you. Thank you, Julianne. Uh, I'd now like to uh, welcome Dr. Chris Wallace uh, to join Julianne uh, in the conversation to further explore these ideas uh, and the idea of Australia. Uh, Dr. Chris Wallace is an Associate Pro Professor at the 5050 by 2030 Foundation at the University of Canberra. She works in modern and contemporary political, international and global history with special reference to leadership transnational lives and transformational change and the information strategies that underpin these. She was the National Archives of Australia Cabinet Historian uh, from 2020 to 2021 and Dr Wallace is also an associate of the ANU Centre for Digital Humanities Research. The conversation has twice named her one of Australia's top thinkers in 2017 and 2019 so it gives me great pleasure to welcome Dr Chris Wallace. You are on fire, woman. <laughs> um, many in the room and listening online will know Julianne as one of the great ultramarathoners of Australian public intellectual life. Uh, for decades, she's been one of the great uh, multipliers, one of the great amplifiers of powerful ideas for good in Australian society and beyond. And I think... I'm feeling like this is a, a kind of a compressed bomb <laughs> from you into the Australian polity uh, to try and shake us up and out of, as you so compellingly describe it in the book, a terra nullius of the mind mm. in which we are all stuck. You're a great rememberer, Julianne. You must be exhausting. <laughs> So tell us about <laughs> why you have, a, have embraced this role as the great rememberer and stimulator of action in a society you clearly think is deeply stuck. Well, I care a great deal. Um, and if I didn't care, I wouldn't bother. Um, I think the, um, the, it's, it's interesting for people of my generation. So I'm, I was born in the, the mid-late 1950s. And I think over my lifetime, this society has been transformed. And I think that in a funny sort of way, growing up as the, many of the changes that have produced the sort of, the, the very good society that we have now, um, to see them happening and to see them then stall is a, has been a matter of profound uh, disappointment. You know, that as we've got richer, we've got meaner, um, we've lost some of that, some of that urgent excitement and possibility of being an independent, outward-looking nation that really, you know, values some of the old mythic ideas. And I think that, I, you know, what I try, was trying to do in the way in the book was to try and trace how that had happened, why it had happened, and what the what the underlying causes were, and how we might, in a way, rebuild some of the momentum to the good ideas of Australia that have been around for much of my growing up. The, the scope of the book is extraordinary. Um, you're, as a, an archival researcher yourself, uh, pretty phenomenal. And I think, uh, as I look around the room here, there are many people who, you know, as we sit here in the National Library of Australia, are familiar from the special collections uh, room and probably have looked at some of the documents you have. Most people haven't. Um, I'm, I'm fascinated that you've situated tonight's talk squarely in the national cultural mm. institutions in the parliamentary mm. triangle. Mm. What is your relationship to Canberra um, yourself? 
Yeah, it's interesting. Look, I don't. I'm. I am not a great archival researcher. You know, you it's are. There are many good. people who are. It's pretty I'm, good. I'm, I think what I am quite good at is I'm quite a good synthesizer. I'm quite good at picking and pulling and and you know finding digging down to the next level. Um, I don't make great claims myself as a you know as a you know in that to that degree. Um, my relationship with Canberra. Well, look, I think like like everyone. I mean, I like so many people. I mean, I, I've never lived here full time. Um, my children both went to ANU, so I spent an awful lot of time here during their university years. And my professional life, probably since, um, well, since I became a journalist, um, really, I've pivoted in and out of Canberra. So I've always had a sort of working relationship, you know, with the place. When I was doing my, um, I was attached for a few years to the um, Reshaping Australian Institutions project at, at ANU. Um, and so I spent a lot of time here at day and you at the time. So I've sort of been in and out. I just sort of, I feel like it's, um, you know, it's very much part of, of who I am and I'm very fond of it and very familiar with it. I think th one of the things that I was trying to do in the book um, is that, is to try and explore that if you, if you start talking about the nation, which is, you know, itself I understand quite a problematic thing in, in, so, in, some, in some regards. I think when we talk about Australia that we tend to do the acknowledgement of, of centuries of, uh, of uh, First Nations settlement, occupation and deep communion with the land. And then we get to the point of British arrival. And that's the point that we turn, tend to start the conversation about the place from. And I guess what I was trying to do in the book is to acknowledge all of that, you know, and go into it in some detail. But to say, well, actually, the real part of the nation starting is with Federation. And we don't actually pay much attention to that. I mean, even in the debates around Australia Day, for instance, I mean, it pivots on Cook and Philip, you know, who in many ways were blokes doing jobs. You know, they were here on a mission, you know, work, they had their papers, they were signed by the king or whoever, and they came to do what they did. But it, that, was, that colonial project is different to the process of creating a nation which is independent, and it's taken this nation a long time to tease out and detach from that colonial foundation. And that's why Canberra is important, because Canberra is the epicentre of that, that, that idea, you know, that very presence of the nation is embodied in this place. As, as you sketched out then, you know, the original agents of colonisation as kind of mid-level uh, executors of bureaucratic policy, it connects so absolutely with the travesty uh, of the buildings, the fate of the buildings, mm. symbolising so much more in this very spot. Mm, mm. Um, is this actually part of the secret of our failure to launch as a as a nation? Or are we trapped by some not good enough EL ones that uh, keep stuffing up the parliamentary <laughs> triangle, destroying the opera house? Um, yeah, look. It's, it's, it's funny, I mean... Are we really a nation of bureaucrats, not well, bronzed I, 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 I swimmers? Think that's, I, mean, I think that's, that's, that may be part of it. It may be that we're a nation of bureaucrats, but we're a nation increasingly not... I mean, increasingly a nation of bureaucrats who have been um, um, told that the public good value of, the, of a public bureaucracy has been devalued, and so it can all be competitive and you can do it all on your own website and it can all be sold out. So I think that that sort of, um, that transition is interesting. Look, there haven't been, and you, you've done your work in this area, I mean, there haven't been a surplus of great leaders um, in this country. I mean, they've been important leaders, they're people who've made great contributions, but in the sort of political domain, you know, if you line them up, there's, it's, it's not an inspiring bunch, I think. Yeah, agree. <laughs> but you have been inspired in your life, and you explain in the book some inspiring mm, moments yeah. in the development of the nation that we've kind of lost the spirit of. Mm, mm. For you personally, what's been the turning point from excitement, hope, patience to a kind of a, a curdled disappointment, if I can put it that way? <laughs> oh, it tinged with hope. Yeah. Um, we'll look, get, we'll get to hope. Don't yeah, worry, yeah, folks. We'll Don't hope, give yeah, up hope. Okay, Don't reach for the razor blades yet. <laughs> there will be hope. Um, look, I think that for me, um, I mean, I, I spent my early adolescent or my early adulthood in Queensland, um, and that was under the um, JB occupation period, um, which was, you know, I think a sort of slapdash, nasty, 
autocracy. I mean, it was a corrupt government. They behaved badly. They were, you know, they were bullies. They were thugs. They were, they were anti-intellectual. They were, you know, they were not, they were not good people, if you like. Um, and so, growing up as a young, young adult in that environment, <coughs> I mean, shaped a sense of both the danger, you know, the, the negative negative politics and how negative politics can really have a um, have a, a stifling effect on a community. Um, but it also made you aware of the power of protest and opposition. And while at the time when I was sort of a, you know, a student and so on, it seemed that that would never result in much change, um, you know, within a decade of my graduation, the government had changed, the Fitzgerald Inquiry had delivered its reforms, and the society began a profound, profound change. So I think that one of the um, elements of that was that it taught me, it gave me a taste for what, you know, a bad government could do to its people, but it also made me realise that change was possible. So that provides a sort of frame, in a sense, for, for my sort of view of the world. Um, I think that what struck me with some astonishment and disappointment was I was reporting for the Courier Mail at the time that Pauline Hanson was elected. And it was a bit of a joke, you know. I mean, you could understand the sort of economic suffering that people in the area that she'd been living in were feeling, and I've written a lot about that over the years. Um, but her election was sort of absolutely a bolt from the blue. Now, in the early, the first year of Pauline Hanson's sort of slightly crazed um, role as the member for, um, what was her seat? I can't remember her seat. Whatever it was, Ipswich East. Oxford. Yeah, Oxley, that's right, thank you. Very um, good. That's good. <laughs> <laughs> but when she was, but when she was first elected, I mean, when she first came down here to do her first speech, I mean, she was basically condemned. You know, that the overwhelming response was that this was an unacceptable form of discourse. You couldn't be blaming Aboriginal people. You couldn't be blaming Asians. You couldn't be saying this stuff honestly in a straight face. It wasn't a matter of political correctness. It was just wrong, and it was not acceptable behaviour. What astonished me, and I'm astonished many, is that within 25 years, 26 years, you know, this, the ideas that are embodied in that sort of one nation sentiment um, have become so much a part of the mainstream political discourse that, that they've twisted everything. You know, there is, is a small percentage of the people, of the population, but it's actually taken a, a really strong foothold. So that gave me real pause for thought that, you know, the changes that I thought were sort of incrementally working towards could be pulled back so bad, so sharply. Um, I think that when the whole refugee stuff really escalated in 2001 and then continued to do so, and the language that started to be being used about not just the we'll decide who comes to the country and so on, but the, the violent brutality of the language, you know, that was really, again, corroded the sort of whole political discourse. And so <clears throat> it made me think, my goodness, you know, are these, is this way of thinking so deeply ingrained in the DNA of the country that we can never escape it. And so it made me want to go back and try and understand um, where that came from. And, uh, you know, in the process, sort of discovered that it had never really been cauterised. You know, that, for instance, the, the three founding bits of legislation um, in the first... Um, in the first federation parliaments. I mean, the first thing, the first piece of legislation was about the deportation of Pacific Islanders who'd been brought here effectively as slaves. And the reason that Sir Samuel Griffiths and others really wanted that, that to get up, and it was one of the first political deals of the, of the federation, was not out of any sort of humanitarian concern for these, that these people have been, well, at some level, there was some humanitarian concern that these people have been brought here under false pretenses. Um, but it was the fear that should they remain, we would get to a state in Australia which was like the racially divi racial division in the United States. And so at the same time, the Americans were actively you know, considering ways of deporting the black population. Here there was a smaller number, it was more manageable and it could pass the parliament. As it transpired, I mean, many of the people who'd been brought here didn't actually want to go back. Um, and there was legal action and there were petitions and so on, and, and it didn't quite go to the, the quite, not quite the same numbers were deported as was originally proposed. So that's number one. Number two is the white Australia policy. So for decades before Federation, I mean, the politicians and others had, had been actively 
amping up the fear, you know, of what the, of what the Chinese represented. Now, the first boat of Chinese um, brought here were like the like the islanders. I mean, they were effectively kidnapped and brought on a boat when some traders were worried that they um, that with the end of the cessation of um, of, the, of, of convicts coming, they wouldn't have enough labour. You know, it was sort of like it's an inversion of the whole process. So the White Australia policy, you know, by the end of that year. Now Lord Hoped and the Governor General at the time didn't want to sign the legislation. I mean, the British government had been really pushing back on lots of the lots of that legislation. Eventually, it passes and, and goes ahead. And the next was the um, was the the political deal to give women the vote. Now, the fact that female suffrage wasn't included in the Constitution, I mean, is in my view a, a travesty. I mean, it could well have been, um, but the feeling was amongst the whiskery men who were dominating the talks that this was just a, a bridge too far and it would be sorted out with a political deal. And so the political deal was that, um, you know, it was to grant women the vote in 1902. But in the process, the vote was taken away from a whole bunch of other people. Um, including First Nations people who didn't already have it in the states that you know had given them the vote, so it seems to me that that foundational story, those three bits of bits of legislation, they, it's like they keep coming back. You know, it's like a you know some sort of reflux. And the 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 when you sort of then look at the dismantling over time of the White Australia policy, um, I mean, there's never been a formal apology, there's never been a formal sort of restitution that's been made in terms of that. I mean, it was eaten away by legislative change, you know, over a 15 year period. Um, but it's never, it's never really, um, the, its importance in terms of the formation of the nation has never really been properly, um, mm -hmm. properly unpacked. Um, equal, full, would you equal say rights there was, for women takes until 84. You know, you these things take a long time to get Would you credit. say there was a respite in that between the Whitlam government disavowing the White Australia policy and the election of the Howard government and the arrival of people like Pauline Hanson in Canberra? What, what was the bit at the beginning of your sentence? Would you say there was a respite from... There was a respite. And, I mean, you know, what happened in that period was that really liberating beginning to engage with an, with an idea of multiculturalism um, that was inclusive and it wasn't just tolerant. It wasn't telling people that they had to assimilate and forget. It was actually a much more active sort of process. Um, and it would seem to me that that's, you know, that's, that's a first step. It's not an end point, it's a first step. And so when the Hanson stuff comes in and starts winding that back, mm. you think, ah, oh, so that was just a step in this process. Back um, to a slapdash nasty autocracy. A slapdash, and that I've was my... I've written that down, that's going to see future use. Yes. So coming back to that yes, Hanson right. moment, yes. Sorry, Andrew, yes. th there's one big element, I think, in the last quarter of a century mm. which doesn't get enough attention either, and that is many people will recall the, the early Pauline Hanson interview on A Current Affair where Mike Willisey put some actual ABS migration mm. data to her about mm. the, the makeup of Australian mm. immigration, mm. and she says, they're just paper figures. And to me it seems the crystallising moment mm. at which mm. we seem to detach from reality mm. uh, in terms of being able to discuss these things. Mm. Um, we can't not talk about that without talking about someone who features regularly in your book, Rupert Murdoch, his media, uh, the hundred years of Australian murdocracy that we've had, uh, given his father Keith and now his son Lachlan. Mm, mm. Yet, it's another of the things that is subjected to the great Australian silence, isn't mm, it? That's can you, true. Can you speak to that? Yeah. Can, can I just talk to the um, to the Pauline Hanson? Um, um, those are just numbers. I mean, that the the thing that I think was really crucial about Pauline Hanson's appeal to her constituents um, was that. Not all of them, but many of them were people who actually had not benefited from the the riches that flowed to many as a result of the sort of economic changes in Australia. Um, now, some of them were, you know, economically, you know, perfectly fine, but but many of them weren't, um, and or they had a sense of grievance because they'd seen what a, you know the, the old structures had crumbled around them. I don't think there was enough attention paid to you know, and this is an ongoing thing, to ensuring that that sort of inequality is, is addressed and, and taken seriously. 
Um, I mean, if people haven't had the same opportunities of, to get a proper education, if they haven't had the opportunities to stretch themselves and learn more, um, they become prey for demagogues. Um, and that's essentially what that... But that don't we have the paradox that they're, in fact, the ones who are develop, delivering power to the demagogues? Absolutely. And, and I think that it's so interesting that the fear of that, you know, what is about 3% of the electorate has now sort of taken over the whole mainstream. Um, and, you know, I mean, the, the Greens on the other end, for instance, I mean, not that there's a real polarity, but, but the Greens, for instance, with 10 or so percentage of vote, have not exercised similar sway. So this little 3% um, has managed to sort of really infuse the whole body, body politic um, to an extraordinary degree. Now, the times suit them, but it's, it's a mystery to me in many ways why how that has occurred. Now, I try to document in the book how it's occurred, but I mean, it's still... Well, it's you still do a good job and you, and you link it to the dominance of the Murdoch media. I do, I do, I do. So what's the, what's the mechanism by which that's working and what could one do about it? Uh, there are many questions there. Thank you, Chris. <laughs> um, look, the, the, one of the things about Australia in its early formation was that at the time of Federation, it was the most literate and numerate society in the world that compulsory education had been introduced in all the colonies at various points in the back half of the 19th century. Um, it, was, it was known as a, a, a republic of newspapers. I mean, every town had its own newspaper and there was, often they were associated with the mayor and property developers because property is one of the, you know, the, gu the guiding elements of the, of the nation. But um, it was a very vibrant, um, environment in which lots of ideas floated around. Now, what you started to see in the 20th century is, of course, a consol that consolidation of the media. And Rupert's father, Sir Keith, was one of the very early um, 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 players in that field of, of, of leading to much greater media concentration. I mean, he was at the Herald and Weekly Times where they bought and sold newspapers, they consolidated titles, they made, you know, ones with one name into two names. Um, they were very closely asso associated with the Collins House group of, of mining companies where they sponsored newspapers that, um, <coughs> that um, uh, were advocates against the unions and against collective action. So there was a long history of those newspapers playing a very overtly political role. Um, what we've seen in the last couple of decades um, has just been an amping up of that process and it's sort of the last man standing and that's, and that's the Murdochs. I mean, the Murdochs own 70 odd percent of, of the newspapers in the country, um, which are of course a shadow of their former selves in many cases. Um, but that, that occupies a big space. It, it, I mean, in terms of the architecture of silence, you know, it absorbs a lot of airtime that pushes out the stuff out. Um, and yet, the phenomenon is largely undiscussed. Undiscussed. Yeah. I mean, it's been interesting to watch the, you know, the campaign that uh, that Kevin Rudd and, and others have been running about a royal commission. Now, politically, it's an impossibility. Um, politically, you're not going to see. Um, a, a newly elected Labor government um, in a land where 75% of the newspapers are owned by one company, having a major royal commission into the powers of that, of that enterprise. But what that enterprise has done, and it's a lesson that's been learnt over many, many, many decades in this country, is that new, uh, owning a newspaper is a key to power. And it was the case in the, from the earliest colonial days. You know, it was there with, um, with Wentworth and the Australian. You know, they owned a newspaper, they got an influence. It's always been the pattern here. Um, I used in the book a couple of strong examples of one of Sir Robert Menzies saying sometime after he was no longer Prime Minister, you know, well, I never had the courage to really take them on, you know. Um, David McNichol, who was for a long time the, the, the sort of the silver-haired genius of the, of, the Packer, of the Packer enterprise, saying after he's retired, oh, my mission was to get people to vote against their own self-interest. I mean, there was always a political sort of agenda which the media, media owners um, were never backwards in coming forward in turn to use. I mean, that was the sort of central argument of my book on the fourth estate, you know, that the, that the commercial power had distorted that capacity for independent journalism because they became sort of stage armies. And delivered a massive, now century-long megaphone for a slapdash, nasty autocracy 
to flourish in. And, and happen. I don't think we're quite... A, that was a Queensland thing about autocracy. I don't think we're nationally no, no, at the I'm, autocracy I'm line. it because uh, I used to wonder what it would be like to be a journalist in the Weimar Republic mm. in Germany in the 1930s, reporting day in, day out, uh, millimetric changes that then gathered, gathered pace and led to, a, yeah. to the hijacking of democracy and a disastrous, disastrous world yeah. war. And what I'm seeing, you know, and, and your book contextualises this so well, uh, the, the persistent forces in Australia that keep coming back mm. to override, you know, other strong seams of goodness, uh, uh, you know, yeah. the drive for inclusion and fairness that so prominently breaks out every now and then to our immense credit as a society and to the benefit of many people, it keeps getting eroded uh, by nefarious forces and I think isn't it true that we've exported this to the world now you know could you have had Donald Trump without Australian Rupert Murdoch's Fox News you know I would argue not and you know you look at the commentary in the US now as we're nearly halfway through to the next presidential election and the January 6th Capitol Hill riot is just you know that there's barely been anything approaching justice in terms of getting the the high-level perpetrators as opposed to the low-level grunts. Mm. I mean, this is catastrophic. Yeah, that's true. Look, I mean, I I agree with with much of what you're saying. I mean, one of the things that I try to do in the book is to try and put Rupert Murdoch, the growing up of Rupert Murdoch, as it were, into some sort of context that explains his evolution now. Um, And it it is sort of interesting. I mean, um, he... he, there There are... People of a certain generation, you know, who probably now quite in their dotage, but, you know, um, who remember a young Rupert Murdoch as part of the sort of swashbuckling, sort of nationalistic sort of enterprise. I mean, the creation of the Australian here in Canberra, you know, was an exciting adventure. You know, the, the willingness to actually challenge the old, you know, what was a very closed, inward-looking society um, in the sort of uh, 50s and 60s, to, to really challenge that, you know, was something that he took very seriously. I mean, he was as much a product of anyone else who's born in the early 1930s, of the sort of decolonisation and independence movements that swept the world after the war. Um, so, you know, he hated he hated England. He really dis- despised that sort of, that old stuffiness. He, he felt he was disrespected by the Melbourne establishment um, and felt and he had... And then he was disrespected by the Oxford establishment. As he was disrespected yeah. by the Oxford... And, 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 he, and he felt that that was a score that he needed to settle. Now, that chimed quite nicely with the group of people, and, you know, it was a widespread movement, who were really trying to assert a different sort of Australian independence in those sort of post-war mm-hmm. years. What he realised was that actually, if he wasn't the smartest person in the room, he was probably the smartest person at marshalling an argument to get what it was that he was after. And as he realised that in that challenge, he could make a fortune and have an influence beyond his wildest imaginings as a, as a young man, I think that just became the end in itself. Um, and, you know, sure, his politics, you know, move as that would necessarily take it. Um, but it's very much a product of this sort of environment. Um, and uh, as you say, I mean, the global influence of that is, is extraordinary. And, you know, I mean, I'm not a psychotherapist, but, you know, it, it does... It just seems that you find the, the germs of that in, in the origin story of the man and his father. Um, and if you know that, it sort of makes sense of some of the... Um, some of the the sorts of writing and the sorts of behaviour which is very much encouraged in those newspapers. Um, you know, you, the, the columnists who write for those papers have a platform, an unrivaled platform, because there's so little else. Um, they, have a, they have a capacity to make an argument um, and a point of view that they want to express. But many of them have, they write with an with a almost palpable sense of there being a chip on their shoulder. Grievance. Grievance. You know, it's nothing it's scratchy, and there's a scratchiness mm. about them, and a muscular scratchy. I mean, I know I'm mixing my, mixing my metaphors, but, but the, it's not just that they're a bit uncomfortable. They're, they're quite prepared to, you know, have a biff about it. Um, and so I was all, I'd always, it always struck me that that was such a characteristic of so many of those people that I knew. And I, I was sort of intrigued when I went back and reread a lot of those Murdoch biographies to realise that that was... That was an essential part of his demeanour as well. And so, you know, people like that 
recognise others and take them with them. You know. So are we to be endlessly hostage in history to young bullied men with chips on their shoulder who oh, become power? I mean, thinking, you know, young Rupert, uh, Vladimir Putin, Donald Trump. It's a particular psychology. I mean, do we have to go through this again and again it's and again? It's so interesting, isn't it? I mean, I, one of the things that I'm really intrigued by, um, and it sort of became sharper as, as I was doing the research and reading and thinking for the book, um, you know, this has always been represented as a very male society. Um, and, you know, partly that's a reflection of, you know, numbers. Um, but it, it became very clear that, you know, that there's, this is, there's an equally and terribly persuasive story about... Um, female agency and a sort of different point of view. Um, now, it's not been the winner <laughs> in the in the historical framing of the place, but the the women who've yet. been advocate yet, <laughs> but the women who've been advocates and the you know the men who've been advocates of that sort of point of view as well. Um, but the women who've been advocates, you know, were there making serious cases, you know, right from right from the beginning of the sort of colonial set of the penal settlement, but then certainly into the colonial life, and then the beginning of the of the federation process, you know, or the pre-federation process. Um, and I think it's so interesting that in this political moment that we're in now, that the overwhelming majority of the independents who are standing are all women. They're women who are not aligned with party, you know, the traditional parties. Um, and they're advocating a different sort of politics, which is very much more locally based, um, accountable, responsible, you know, in close communication with um, the, their electors, which was there in the arguments that mm. Rose Scott and others were making in the pre-Federation um, debates. They got sidelined by the whiskery blokes, but they were there making the case. And it wasn't just about women having the vote. It was about a different sort of politics. Mm. Um, and Rose, Rose Scott, who was a Sydney-based feminist, you know, she used to say that that um, you know, she had no faith in, faith in these genius, genius men who would sort of aggregate all power to themselves in a faraway place mm. um, and just become detached. So it's so interesting that you know, 100 odd years on, we're seeing many of those same arguments being made again by women in a very active you yeah. know, political, political engagement. Yeah. Very, very interesting point. I've, I've myself made a close study over the last 18 months, two years, of many of the independent campaigns going on around the country to learn, try and work out why what they're doing is working on the ground. Mm. And it, it struck me as I've been observing this that, you know, it's this old-fashioned thing that used to be so familiar to so many of us called community organising. Mm. Uh, very basic, logical, political craft that the major parties used to practise back in the day themselves, mm. but as they've become more and more kind of oligopolistic in their operations and, you know, very top-down in their manner. And very professionalised, you know, that you, it's all about the numbers, it's all very professionalised, yeah. But, but you make a killer point about these independent campaigns and their female candidates. Yeah. Uluru, tell us about it. Yeah, look, uh, can I just add something to your comment there and then I'll bring in the Uluru thing. Um, one of the things, I mean, I think you're right about that old-fashioned campaigning, and I th it seems to me that there are a couple of factors which are really sort of worth um, playing into that. One is that the COVID times have forced people to go back into the local. You know, because physically you couldn't go more than five kilometres in many places for, for much of the last two years. Places you used to drive past, you walk past, you know, people who never talked to, you had time to chat to. Now, I know there's an enormous amount of hardship and difficulty associated with that period, but it did force people to focus on the local in a way that they hadn't previously done. Um, Can I give you a tiny, tiny little fantastic yeah. example of this? Yeah. The a female independent running in Flinders called Despi O'Connor yeah. was a local school teacher, mm. and during the, the first protracted Melbourne lockdown, with no political experience at all, from a standing start, created an, an entirely online political campaign to get elected to the local Mornington Peninsula Council because she was so disgusted at the decisions being made. Mm. She got elected and became mayor. Yeah. So, yeah. you know... And she's now standing... busy, people. Yeah, yeah. And she's so interesting. I mean, I was on a panel with her the other night. She's a very interesting woman. So that local stuff, I think, is really powerful. Um, and it's something that the major parties have given up on because the sort of that old process of centralising into Canberra and it's all about, you know, it's all about the, the big deals and the numbers that are incomprehensible and so on, you know, that that sort of... Um, that bleeds out the local. The other part of it is that the environmental 
moment that we're in, I mean, in terms of fires and floods and, you know, climate change and all the rest of it, I mean, that affects where you live. And so people are forced to engage with that in a way that they didn't necessarily used to have to, unless they were farmers or something. Um, so that's, that's two elements. The third is, and this touches on the Uluru thing, one of the things that the, the most important thing of Uluru is constitutional recognition and the voice. I mean, that's the, that's the bedrock. Sitting above or below it, wherever you go with bedrock, um, that is, is this notion of, of truth-telling. Um, now, truth-telling is necessarily a local activity. I mean, you can't tell a generic big story. Well, you can tell a big, generic big story, but, but the, the truths are the local truths, and the truths are the stories of local people and place. Um, so that plays into that local stuff as well, you know. So when people are forced to engage at that very local level, and then they they say, and I've I've seen this in my area, people say, "What's the story here? What happened here? There must be something about this, you know, blah blah blah." And and in some cases the stories can be answered, in some cases they can't. But the sort of native title process, process for all its flaws, has made a lot of that material much more accessible. People are looking for it. So you see in Victoria and in Queensland already very active steps towards the, pr the truth-telling part of leading towards treaty. My sense is that as that happens, as has happened in a whole lot of other areas where re revealing the stories of First Nations Australia occurs in the public domain, it will lead to more of that storytelling of subsequent arrivals as well. So there's lots of stories that get layered on top of it. Um, so the thing that's interesting to me about the... Or one of the things that's interesting to me about the independence, and I raised it in this meeting the other day, this Zoom thing the other day with a bunch of the independents, um, including um, the woman standing in Kuyong and the woman standing in Bradfield, as well as uh, the woman standing in, in Flinders, um, was that when you look at the, their agendas, it's, it's, a, a it's climate change, anti-corruption, <coughs> accountability... Gender equity. Gender equity. They're the three. They're the three big issues. And while a number of them have Uluru somewhere tucked down on their list of priorities, it seems to me that when you talk about the foundational flaw at the heart of the nation, the thing which is not being resolved in our 121 years or whatever it is of nationhood, has not been resolved since Jeremy Bentham said in 1803 that it was a failure to have a treaty with the people who were here when the British arrived promised to be an incurable flaw. It seems to me that not having the Uluru issue central in that campaign of the independence is a bit of falling into the old ways um, because my sense is that until we as a nation resolve that, it's going to be very difficult to get beyond the nuts and bolts of the, oh, we need a corruption thing here, we need that there. I mean, you know, important initiatives, no doubt. But there is a sort of, you know, it's like this wound that needs to be addressed. And it was interesting to me that that while in that conversation I had with the independents, they, they all agreed, but they were worried that there was no political mileage in it. They were already thinking like politicians. They were already thinking like politicians. Yeah. Oh, dear. Yeah. Briefly, but importantly, <laughs> you've, you've mentioned in conversation that people are deeply reluctant. You can almost sense a kind of tension and can we just move on quickly from the indigenous, necessary indigenous part of this conversation that is so crucial to your argument in, the, in this book. Mm -hmm. You know, you're, you're sensing this again and again as you're touring the book. You know, how do we get people past that? How do we persuade people broadly that, you know, this is something we've got to sit with and work on, not tensely acknowledge and try and quickly move past? Have I, you worked out a technique in, uh, since you've been subjected to this so often? Yeah, look, I, I, I mean, all I do is I just keep saying it, uh, which is probably not very, you know, that's a bit dumb, but anyway. Um, but I, it, look, I think people feel uncomfortable about it because there is a deeply embedded sense of shame. I mean, we've, we have observed the trauma and we've witnessed the retelling of trauma that First Nations people have been subjected to and have endured. And we see it still in you know, media coverage all the time. Um, and we sort of want 
we, we sort of want that trauma story to keep on being told. Well, it's not sufficient to keep telling it. You've actually got to tell it and move on. I and mean, it's some sort of a much more sen a much more pr important You've process got to of deep it listening and, ex and accept the reality of it. That's right. And 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 but it's a deep listening. It's a deep respectful listening that needs to address that. Um, and you know, it's sort of like trauma and shame are the flip side of each other. And and until we can do that respectfully, it's very difficult to actually address this sort of feeling that actually we didn't do the right thing or the right thing wasn't done and we haven't repaired it. Um, I do think it's really intriguing to, and important that, I mean, my growing up in rural Australia, and I'm sure many of you had similar sort of background, you know, similar sorts of experiences. I mean, the, the contact that people had, I mean, the contact that in a town you had with people who were living in shanty camps in the most deplorable circumstances. I mean, I can remember as a child in country New South Wales feeling profoundly discomforted by that. Now, moving beyond a sense of discomfort to something else takes a lot of work. It takes a lot of patience, it takes a lot of respect, it takes a lot of listening, it takes a lot of a lot of talking and it takes a willingness to re, you know acknowledge your own you know small bit um, now that's an ongoing thing and it means that people it's why I sort of I do it because I mean I have a lot of First Nations friends and colleagues and the burden of constantly having to re-prosecute this stuff is just brutal. You know, it is so brutal to see see the sort of the relentless demands. I mean, I think that on this side of the ledger, in a sense, we have to stand up and say we've got to own this as well. You know, they've got to take the lead. We've got to own it, um, and that's that's hard. Um, um, as you say in the book, yeah. to end on hope quoting you, the aspirational ethos to belong could be revived, stripped of its foundational flaws. A fully formed nation grounded in a civic, not ethnic way of belonging without fear is still possible. Mm. Mm. You, you give us hope in this. Well, it's, I... it's not a, my God, we've just got to bulldoze Australia into the Arctic Ocean. Um, but the yeah. knowledge embodied in here is so crucial to be shared, mm. widely discussed, embraced, and most importantly, acted upon. Mm. How do we finally get people to act, to to seek out, embrace, and act on the necessary knowledge to make us unstuck, to get us out of the the toxic pit we seem to have been? Well, I mean, I just got accidentally parked in. <laughs> um, I guess. Look, I'm just hoping that. I mean, one of the things is that a lot of people don't know a lot of stuff, and so what I've tried to do is to tell stories that make things accessible and, and interesting, um, and doesn't make the history boring. Um, I've tried to personalise it in a way that tells some of my stories, so that it feels like it's you know it's it's a bit intimate, um, and I've tried to tie it into this moment in time. Um, and so it's not a history book, it's not a memoir, and it's not a contemporary manifesto, but it's a bit of all of them. And, and by braiding them together, and I hope providing some, some accessible points where people can have conversations, that it, it starts the conversation and starts the dynamic. Well, this, it's already there, it just gives it a bit more form. Um, I mean, one of the things in my observation of the sort of ups and downs and long waves of, of change in Australian society, which is much the same in many other places, um, is that the people are ahead of the politicians. I mean, the resistance to change comes from the top much more than it comes from on the ground. I mean, people have accommodated in their personal lives the most profound changes um, in my lifetime. Um, and, you know, you saw that in the, in the same-sex marriage uh, referendum. You know, it was overwhelmingly supported. People were wanting you know, older people wanted their children to be able to marry whoever they wanted. It wasn't, that was not an issue. But the, 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 this process of trying to hold the status quo to prevent change, I mean, it, I could never really understand it. And I realised that was the end in itself. I mean, preventing the change held the status quo. So the challenge is always there to get more, get more air into it so things can move along. Well, it's a mighty achievement. I congratulate you, Thank Julianne. You, you are a, a warrior for a much better <laughs> Australia. I thoroughly commend the book, and let's all thank Julianne for writing the book and speaking so well tonight. Thank, thank you. you.
Um, thank you so much, Julianne and Chris, uh, for tonight. Um, moving us from uh, curdled disappointment to aspirational <laughs> ethos, uh, I think was a, a terrific to be able to hear that. Um, thank you everyone for coming tonight. Uh, that brings our uh, official proceedings to an end. Uh, Julianne, you still have time upstairs to oh, sign doctor, books? Yeah. Um, so Julianne will be able to sign books up in the foyer for us and the bookshop is open, um, not only for um, copies of The Idea of Australia, if you haven't already gotten them, but uh, also Dr Wallace's book, uh, How to Win an Election, which might come in handy uh, in this uh, election year as well. Um, both available tonight at a special 20% discount as well. Um, thank you everyone for coming. We hope to see you again at the library soon. Thank you.